So hello everyone and welcome to this week's talk on social engineering and some uh, stuff around social engineering. So at the end of this talk, um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the actual details and how much money this actually affects businesses and some of the more like nitty gritty details. So we're going to head over to Discord to do that so we can have a proper discussion about it um, because it is a huge thing at the moment with social engineering um, during COVID because a lot of people are working from home and a lot of people are quite scared about uh, phishing emails and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm just going to play the uh, sort of like presentation and we're all going to have a discussion at the end. So hope you enjoy. So hello everyone and welcome to today's cyber clinic presentation. Today I'm going to be talking about phishing and all of that kind of stuff, social engineer toolkit, showing you some videos of how it's done. Because at the moment, phishing is a massive, massive point in the industry for cybersecurity and an even bigger point for hackers at the moment. There's a lot of fake stuff coming out with fake links to COVID emails and stuff like that. So as I say, this is getting quite uh, thorough and quite a big industry to talk about. So. If I'm going to be showing you today the Social Engineers Toolkit, this all is still or could be considered illegal if you aren't doing it for a valid purpose. So there is a way that you can do this legally, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that later. Uh, but for the majority of the time, again, our standard disclaimer, if you do this outside of, sort of like your educational environment, we cannot be held responsible. Um, please don't do it if you are going to be doing it maliciously. So as I say, today we're gonna to be covering the basics of social engineering, the SET toolkit, which is the social engineers toolkit, um, the security and research uh, and productivity tools for Linux is a video done by Carl. Um, and he's gonna be talking through what he uses on a daily basis or a semi-daily basis uh, in his Linux environment and all of the stuff that he follows along with to try and sort of like help out and keep up to date with that stuff. So first of all, what is social engineering? Some of you may have heard of it, some of you might not have. It's the, uh, the art of revealing information or getting information out of individuals. So we all know now that we've watched a couple of videos and some of these other talks that you can get information out of a computer system quite easily. You upload it to a file sharing site or you go in and just manually look at the data, but humans are the weakest part in any cybersecurity. So if I can phone up the support line and ask for a new account or something like that to then just access the information by just logging into the site, great. It means that I've had to do basically no work, but it is an art. You have to have the right amount of, sort of like nuance and persuasion and embarrassment and all of these other things to make the whole thing work. And it's oftentimes information that people don't want out in the wild. So when I say out in the wild, I mean, this information is stuff that they want to keep more private. So it might be uh, parts of their security question, like which was your first school growing up? So when we think about, if someone just walks up to you and says, what school did you go to growing up? What was your first school? What's your mother's maiden name or stuff? You're not just gonna tell the random person on the street, I would hope. But if someone comes up to you and like you're in a bar or something, they start talking to you or you're in the line for a coffee and all of a sudden a conversation just comes round to school saying, oh, I'm new to the area, I've got a young daughter, I'm looking at sort of like trying to get her into her first school, is there any you'd recommend? Most of the time they're gonna recommend whatever school they went to. It might have been the worst school in the world, but it's gonna be one of the only ones they know. So most probably they're gonna recommend that one. If they recommend something else, you say, oh, but which school did you go to? Or did you go to that school? And it's one of those things that then you can open up the question and start getting the answers to their security questions for their password resets or whatever. Or if you're talking about family and stuff, oh, mum, well, maiden names, all that kind of stuff. What kind of music do you listen to? What was your first album? All those kind of things. You can slowly work the information out of them. But it's the art of not asking too much that you've set off their alarm bells. But it's asking the right kind of questions to draw the information out. So I'm going to be covering quite a few kinds of social engineering attacks. So... For me, my personal one is always in person, on the phone. Um, I can read body language better. I can sort of look for non-social cues because on emails and stuff, unless you get it perfectly right first time, 
or you're not going to get it. And also there's a lot of sort of like uh, campaigning at the moment, being aware of phishing emails, sort of like all of this stuff is everyone is looking at the phishing email side of it and the text message side of it. But so they're less inclined to think if someone phones them that they're going to be fake or something like that. Because emails, as I say, are currently the big issue because you've probably all received some of them in the last couple of weeks. Um, but they're everywhere. Less common in mail. So actual snail mail being sent to you. These can happen. I got one probably maybe six, seven weeks ago where something came through the door, checked the website that it went to, completely and utterly fake. They had a .net instead of a .com um, on their email address just on the piece of paper. Um, and I almost fell for it because it was sort of like an energy supplier. So all of these things do happen. So there are uh, just a subset of phishing. So phishing is the email side of it. So you get an email saying, please log into your account. There's been some problem with your payment. You've got a free item on Amazon. You've got a voucher for eBay. Like you've got all of these different things. And they're trying to get you to click the link. Clicking the link most of the time isn't the, the end of the world problem. The problem comes in when you then enter your details into their fake website or the website that it took you to. So I'm going to be showing you how to do this later with the Social Engineers Toolkit. It's a very, very clever piece of software. It has hundreds of options. Again, very command line based tool, uh, but it is incredibly, incredibly good. So whaling is uh, something that you might not have heard of. Whaling is going after one particular big ticket target. So this one target will be sort of like a CEO of a company or the head of IT or someone with a lot of access. And you are going after this one big person because if you can get into their account or you can get them to give you their details or you can get a rat onto their computer, then all of a sudden you have access to everyone in the company. You are only doing it targetedly at the one individual or two or three individuals that have high level access and are incredibly sort of like large targets or very, very high profile targets. Spear phishing is very similar to this. You aren't going after the head honchos or whatever like that. You're going after a subset of particular users. So uh, the easiest way to explain this is if you are auditing a security company, you are going for their oldest employees, for the people that are less likely to have grown up with the internet. So these people are going to be those ones that you are not going to be as likely to be uh, hit by scam emails and stuff. So you're going to try and hit them with this targeting phishing emails. And if you know, let's say for they work for security, you're going to include details about them. So you're going to use a bit of um, sort of like open source intelligence saying, oh, this subset of people in this organization has a particular certification for this. Uh, let's say ISO 27001 physical security, which is a, a quite a industry wide standard. And a lot of people put this on their LinkedIn. So you can say, oh, I'm coming from ISO 27001's office, like IT governance or something like that. Oh, please, can you update your details uh, to keep this qualification in date? That's a very, very good targeted spear phishing email because a lot of people are going to say, I don't want my uh, qualifications to run out. It seems about right. You put in a .com or .net or something, and it's targeted information that you wouldn't normally know about them because you've used some open source intelligence on them. So they're more likely to click that link. Angling is sort of like the passive approach. You leave a bunch of dummy links around, you do a lot of weird stuff and just sort of like slowly wait for people to click it. You aren't targeting, it sets off a lot less alarm bells because you aren't sending emails out to people, but it's something I haven't ever done. So I don't under, like fully understand it. So, these are your common phishing emails that you're probably going to get. Someone from the government saying, oh, please, you need to update your uh, car insurance, your HMRC account, all of these kinds of things where it's sort of like something that is quite urgent because we don't want to pay more tax than we have to. So you're going to quickly log onto their site, double check. Uh, and most of the time, they're also quick things where it's like, uh, please confirm this email address or verify that this email account is still active because if it's a full long please refill out your information we're going to wait for that 
we're going to do that at night when we've got a proper computer or a laptop or something like that. We're not just going to click it on the bus where it just says verify your email address is something quite quick. So most of us will go, oh, I can do that now whilst you've got three, four minutes where those kind of emails, they are coming less and less common, uh, but they are out there. Bad payments. So for your Netflix, PayPal, eBay accounts, they say there's been a problem with your direct debit this month. Oh, OK. I'll log on to that. I'll check that. That's not the end of the world. Uh, you're a contest winner. You've uh, uh, your great uncle has died uh, in Nigeria and we have 75 million pounds worth of gold to give you. Please deposit a small amount into this account so that we can uh, start the paperwork or something like that. That was a huge one and became a huge meme at the moment where it's like, oh, your Nigerian prince is uh, transferring you money because he has to go into exile. Why me? What, there's 75 million people in this country, 70 million people. Why are you choosing me? And why are you not choosing someone you actually know? But a lot of people did fall for it because it was like, oh, it's £100 for a chance to get 15 million or something like that. Um, tax, again, HMRC, no one wants to pay tax, so we all click on those. Or businesses, so, oh, we're offering a free trial of this software or this bloatware, spyware, scareware, which I'm going to be covering later. Oh, yeah, it's the greatest all singing, all dancing software. You probably won't get much of these whilst you're a student, but once you go into industry um, and get start getting jobs at companies with domains, you'll start to get a few more of these coming in saying, oh, yeah, this, this is the greatest software for IT governance or uh, auditing or stuff like that. And it becomes quite a, a big kind of phishing attack. Scareware. So scareware is something that is still out there. It's not as rampant as it used to be because now a lot of stuff is now built into, let's say, Windows or uh, if you're a Mac user, there's less stuff out there for it. But on Windows, there used to be a lot of fake antiviruses. So when uh, the antivirus boom was happening, when all of these big companies were making loads of money, a load of people went out and made fake ones that said, oh yeah, we're protecting your computer from, totally from viruses. There's absolutely uh, nothing that can get past us. Install us and we'll do a free scan so that you can uh, check them. Okay, I download it, it says I've got 27 viruses or I've got 190 viruses and it scares you with big numbers. Um, and then you're going to go away and it says, oh, we can repair all these, but for a fee. Okay, so that's the scare tactics coming in. It says, but they're on my machine and I can get rid of them if I pay nineteen ninety nine for a key for this fake antivirus that just randomly generated these alerts. Um, and this used to be a huge, huge industry. So back probably 2014, 2015, uh, maybe even earlier than that, now, these sort of companies were turning over like 75 million from just these fake accounts. Um, there's a, a good podcast from uh, uh, Jordan Harbringer where he goes on and he talks to an ex-poker player and he covers a lot of detail on this. Um, and it's a very, very informational video, well, sorry, podcast about these fake emails, fake ransomwares, how much money they can make and all of this kind of stuff. Another one of these scareware things is you download, let's say, a free Photoshop where you're like, oh, I'm not paying X amount for Photoshop. Let's just find a dodgy version online. You download it and it then starts encrypting files because it's just actually ransomware. It's just ransomware that has been named Photoshop C2 or something like that, which, as you can think, probably isn't great. And then once it's fully encrypted your hard drive or it's encrypted your critical files, uh, okay, give us X amount of money and we'll unlock your computer. Okay, not great, again. And then spywares. So some of them might say, oh yeah, we are an antivirus. They might work perfectly fine as an antivirus. But they're also going to do a lot of other stuff in the background. They're going to install key loggers, rats, uh, crypto miners is a big thing at the moment. A lot of people have gone away from the individual hacking of the machine and just want the processing power. Turn it all into Ethereum. Uh, Dogecoin, because those two are currently some of the best coins out there for holding their value steady. Bitcoin can go up and down, goes stupidly high, 20 odd grand, all the way down to eight grand. 
it's not a very consistent or even platform. Whereas Ethereum, Dogecoin, they've held their value. So they're not going to be putting Moses spyware on your computer anymore. They're just going to be putting a miner. And again, this is all scareware. So it just says, oh yeah, you can actually edit all these photos with GIMP or Photoshop, but it's also doing stuff in the background. These SMS banking texts, you've probably got a couple if you're on Android, they have started auto blocking them and putting them in a, a subfolder where it's quite hard to locate them. Uh, so they are still there, you're still getting them. It's just that now they are sort of being, uh, not manually, but automatically flagged for you. You can still go in there, read them, click on the links if you need to, but it's trying to help you. A lot of these are from banks saying, did you authorize this payment? No. Of course I didn't. I'm sat in my room doing gaming or making a YouTube video like I am now. Oh, I've not spent £74 on shelving. So you click the link to say, no, no, I haven't. It takes you to a fake banking website. You try and enter your details, stuff like that. Oh, no, sorry, that email address was wrong. But then it redirects to the real site. Blackmail. Oh, we've seen what you're doing late at night through your webcam. Okay, that's cool. I don't have a webcam. That kind of thing. So it's going to blackmail you and say, oh, if you don't want me to uh, send out fake emails to all of your friends or anyone that you have on Facebook, we have compromised your account. I uh, don't think you have, but sure, I'll email you back just to waste your time. COVID fakes. Oh, you have been exposed to someone with COVID. These are massive at the moment. I think I got seven last week just of this kind of email. You have been exposed to someone with COVID. Please click the link to register for a test. Uh, don't think I have. I've been in my room or in my house. Only time I go out is for shopping and I don't use the app. So how do you know where I've been? And always, 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 they are a reinforcement for other social engineering attacks. So it'll say, we have sent you an email. Please go and check your email. So it's adding multiple factors to the same email. So the same phishing attack. They then add um, some additional layers behind it. So saying they'll send you an email, maybe one or two days later, they'll send you a text message and saying, oh, we uh, sent you an email to verify this purchase or reiterate your Netflix account or something like that. But you haven't gone and done it. Your account will be banned in five days. OK, again, urgency. So go on. You'll click on that link then in the email because they, you've got a text message from supposedly Netflix or Amazon Prime or something, which does take a lot more people by surprise because they said, oh, but they've used two methods. Everyone can use two methods. So this video is a very quick so explanation here we have a video and demonstration of, of a phishing uh, attack phishing or a attack, voice, so uh, social voice engineering attack. Phishing. You're going to see a couple of things in here. You're going to see, uh, I'm going to try and point them out as we go through it. cell phone provider and okay. see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my... <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan and we just had a baby and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so there we see a couple of things. So we see uh, the urgency saying uh, we need it done by today, like my husband wanted it done by today. So that's the sense of urgency that is she's bringing in there. Because all of these kinds of emails have this sense of urgency. Uh, or these phone calls, text messages, whatever you want. Like it's a late payment or something like that. So something's going to stop working if you don't do it right away. The reason they're doing that is so that then you don't have time to think about, is this legitimate? Is this not legitimate? If you do it quickly enough, they're going to just follow through with it if you if they believe what you're saying. And then she's also adding in the self-embarrassment thing of the crying baby making herself seem weaker and more vulnerable than she actually is. So this is another social engineering human psychology tactic that is people want to help people in distress because we all want to seem like good people. So if you create that sort of like image in the back of the other person's mind that you are weaker than you are, you are uh, sort of like need help, all of that kind of stuff, they're going to help you more than if you just come in and say, please give me the email address of this account. So that's not going to work as much as getting this backlog and this other information. I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back.
you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for usage information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds. At gmail.com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, she added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number. So what she's doing here is enabling herself to elevate it. So once you get the first little bit of information, so once you get someone to hold the first door open for you if you're doing a physical pen test. So once they hold that first door open for you, they're going to help you get into the rest of the building, open other doors for you. It's that first initial step. So for this, the first initial step for her was getting the email address. And now because there's a bit of rapport between the two people, they feel like they've shared an experience, it's one of those things of now it's a lot easier for her to get more access or more information. So you see this a lot in TV, movies, and all that kind of thing, where someone will start uh, giving off a single piece of information that is not relevant. And once they've given out the first piece of information, they're more likely to give out the second, third, and eventually leading up to more classified things. And they do this in TV because it is how it works in the real world. If you give out one small piece of information, most likely you're going to give out the next small information if they ask a question that backs off of that. And you can slowly elevate your human uh, sort of like privilege and your human relationship with a person to get more and more information. 5127. To set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry. So there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. So as you can see, that was how easy it was just to override and do a singular account. So one single account, you can then say, oh, I'm going to change it to this or that. And if all of a sudden they can't access their phone, you cancel their number. Um, when people start sending you verification texts saying, oh, we've uh, sent a text to your mobile to confirm this change, they're not going to get it anymore because you've technically canceled their account. So on these high profile cases, you see this more often when the higher up the person, the more effort the social engineer puts in. Because not a lot of people are going to go through this amount of effort just for an individual or one or two people. Because it's so much additional effort. Unless they are, as I was saying, a whale. So those whales are those huge, huge ha uh, sort of like things. The, the ones that you are going to put a lot of time into. Because if you manage to pull it off, you've got a huge amount of money from that one account. Um, but these attacks are becoming more and more frequent. So... Now I'm moving on to some of the uh, slightly more fun stuff. So physical social engineering, physical pen testing. So physical social engineering is a sort of like its own breed. You have to be very strangely mindset. You have to have a lot of confidence when you're going into these buildings, when you're trying to get into them. Because a lot of the time, it's all about the way that you carry yourself. If you feel like you're supposed to be there or you act like you're supposed to be there, they're not going to look at you twice. Whereas if you keep looking around, darting your head, if a security guard comes, you falter in your step, all of a sudden they're going to say, that was a bit weird. Hey, what's your name? Where do you work? What are you doing? Uh, and the second you say, uh, you're probably done. Because if you say, someone asks you a question, where do you work? Oh, I'm new. I just started working in the coffee room or I've just gone out to get my first coffee run. So when you are saying these things, it sort of like disarms the other person if you have a believable story. This is going to be less likely now that COVID's a thing, but it's better for us as social engineers because we get to wear a mask. If we wear a mask, less people are going to be able to recognize us, who we are when we're going into these physical legal pen tests. So it is this thing of having props and equipment. So security jacket, if you're going to go wander around a building, uh, you look at what they wear. If they wear 
bright yellow high-vis jackets with security written on the back, you go out, you buy a four ninety nine security jacket. If you are going to go into uh, sort of like a business office, you're not going to go in with your raggedy t-shirt, shorts, and uh, flip-flops on. You're going to dress the part. You're going to get a nice jacket on. You're going to look professional. You're going to carry a briefcase instead of a like a backpack with a load of stickers all over it. You're going to take a laptop that does not look like a hacker's laptop. So you're going to take some silver default Chrome book or whatever that's got Linux loaded on it. Or for me, I have a laptop that's skinned completely like a MacBook, yet it runs barebone Linux and it's a used to be an old Windows machine. So you do all of these things just to blend into it. If you look the part, less people are going to notice you. So that's the uniforms part of it. You look the part. Your equipment and props. If you have your hands full, people are less likely to say, can you just badge in? Uh, no, because I've got my hand filled with six coffees or something. They might just be water in cups, but they're not going to know that. Um, or if you say, it's my first day here, I brought you a coffee and you walk into like an office with a load of coffee things, it's going to instantly disarm the group of people that you are talking to. So you walk in saying, oh, I'm brand new. Here's eight coffee. Who wants one? You hand them round. You start talking to them. You start to elevate your privilege. You can then say with a fake card or fake RFID card saying, oh, I'm supposed to be able to get into this room. It's not working. Can you let me in? Yeah, sure. Because you've got a coffee for them. Okay, that all works. Again, if you're going through turnstiles, they're going to open the turnstile for you because you've got your hands full. Um, only the most diligent security guards are going to say, now I'll hold your coffees for you whilst you get your card out, or you have to wait for someone to come down and let you in, or something like that. But then again, it's all this confidence thing. You can talk your way around it. Where my dad used to work, they had four full-time security guards, and I used to make it a thing of every time that they got a new one, or like a replacement, they wanted me to just, as a joke, see if I could walk in. Sort of like, 16-year-old, okay, we've got a new person coming in tomorrow. Can you see if you can walk into the building? This was a high-security building. Okay, I'll give it a go. I only got in a couple of times, but those couple of times are all that it takes. Then, once you get in and say, actually, I'm not supposed to be here, mate, they say, but what you got in? Or when they say, oh, you'll have to wait for someone to come down and let you in. Okay, that's not the end of the world. I'm just going to chat for you for like 10, 15 minutes. I'm going to fake ring someone. Oh, you're in a meeting right now? When are you available? Oh, you're going to be 35 minutes? Uh, yeah, can you uh, talk to this person just on the security desk for me and let me in? You hand the phone over and it's your mate who's at school or something like that or just on his lunch break. And you're like, oh, yeah, I work upstairs, mate. Yeah, yeah. What desk are you at? Oh, 24B. You just make up something and you walk in that way. So again, it's the you're disarmed when someone phones you up or something like that. So these kind of legal security tests are the way that you need to start doing it. There's less companies that are going to be doing it now, as I say, with COVID, but there are opportunities to go away and do this. So now we're going to move on uh, a little bit. We talked about the basic ideas of some of the uh, complicated, cool stuff. We're going to move on to the toolkits, which are still very, very cool. So these toolkits are sort of like your framework. So like the Metasploit, which is your go-to, oh, I need to see if there's a vulnerability on this system. I'm going to use Metasploit first. Social Engineer Toolkit is, again, you're probably one of your first things that you're doing if you're doing your phishing attack. You can put in copies of emails, uh, clone websites, all of this cool stuff. So it's got about four or five different modes. Phishing, um, you put in your email address, or, sorry, your email. So you can create a file, upload the file um, with just all of the hyperlinks changed. So the way that I've used this in the past is I receive a legitimate email from, let's say, Airbnb or eBay. I will take all of that email, copy it into uh, visual code. I will then change all the hyperlinks to my own website and then send it out. Again, this is all done legally on people that wanted tests. So when they click the link, it lit it cannot look any different to their actual email because it is a real email address and a real email. All it's had is some of the links in the background changed. Um, 
some of the uh, templates that it's got are pretty cool. So it has some basic ones for, like if you're cloning a website, it has a uh, Facebook logon page, it has a Twitter logon page, just as default uh, sort of like templates for you. You can then clone your own websites to then use. Inserting backdoors into the code. So it has Metasploit modules that allow you to, when people click emails or go onto the website and click the websites, oh, it's actually done it. Or it actually creates a backdoor or a reverse PHP script or uh, JavaScript applet, all this kind of stuff. And it can be used for some automatic pen testing, but all the other tools, in my opinion, are slightly better because they're more refined for it. So when you launch it, you have to accept the terms of service, which basically says the same thing that we do. Don't do illegal things with this. So again, it knows that this is a tool that is very, very uh, widely used by malicious people, but they are taking all of the sort of like blame and legality off themselves saying, don't, please don't do things with this. And then you get a, a big menu. The menu here is sort of like all of the different uh, attacks they can do. So I'm going to talk through them briefly. Spear phishing, as I explained earlier, targeting a subset of individuals, putting in specific information and stuff. What I'm going to be showing you is a website attack vector, which is all of your clone a website, upload a fake website, all of those kinds of things. Infected media, so having fake uh, JPEGs or GIFs or these kinds of things that are actually running code behind them. Payload and listener, again, your Metasploit modules. Mass emailers, so you're going to be sending out a mass phishing attack to hundreds upon hundreds of users or thousands of users, and it's going to all sort of like help you automate that process. Arduino is a small C eight plus plus computer, um, and it will sort of like do some stuff with that. I've not actually used this module with it, but it exists. Wireless access point, so this is going to be using what's called an evil twin attack. So it's going to be creating a fake access point that you connect to then running a man in the middle attack within that fake access point to steal all the real data and put it towards your own thing before forwarding it out. So this is sort of like a culmination of some of the attacks we were talking of a couple of weeks ago. The QR code generator, again, I've not used it, but it will create fake QR codes. So at the moment, with COVID being as big as it is, you put this outside of a shop saying, this is the COVID tracker for this location. Someone scans it, it takes you to a fake, uh, NHS website. Okay, that's really easy to do nowadays. PowerShell attacks, absolutely rampant right now. Empire scripts, all of those kind of things. And third-party modules, again, everything basically in Kali Linux can be coded to suit your own desires. So website cloning, that's what, as I say, what I'm going to be talking about right now. So you want to be able to access uh, your website. So you can host this on your home IP and just forward the ports out, but some routers don't like you forwarding out port 80 or 443 because they know that that's what websites are going to be running on. Um, but you can just host it on a VPS. You can get some little cloud droplets, um, ocean droplets, uh, Contabo VMs, all of these kind of like super cheap VMs for, where you pay by the hour almost, or AWS where you get some free credits with your university account. You can go onto there, set it up on there. Buy a similar domain. So I was testing this again on some businesses that I can't say the name of, uh, where you get a similar domain for them. So if they have registered .com, .co.uk, .net, all of these other things, you just buy one that's very, very similar. Sorry about that. But you buy something that's very similar to them. Um, and then you are going to just literally try and subvert the traffic to that instead. I did see one very, very cool one a couple of years ago where they were redirecting the DNS traffic. So they managed to get, like, do a social engineering attack on the DNS uh, provider. The DNS provider then said, like, oh, what do you want to do with our, your account? And they said, we're changing from uh, .com to .net. I want you to redirect every piece of traffic that goes to .com to .net. And the company went, okay, you've got all the right information. So here's literally your entire site traffic data that's going to this new cloned website. Uh, okay. And then they were just taking a copy of all the credentials before sending them onto the real site. Um, but they 
the only reason they got caught was because when they forwarded them back onto the real site, they got stuck on the loop of the DNS, then pushing them back to the fake site, then back to the real site, then back to the fake site. And it just created a loop and it ended up getting discovered that way. But a lot of these companies and website cloners are going to be trying to steal credentials so that they can log onto the legitimate website. So if you think you're doing with this with like Amazon and stuff like that, if you get one password for it, you can try that password on a bunch of other sites to see if they are reusing passwords. So once you go into the uh, sort of like the web based module, you're going to have a, a quick look at what all the different kinds of attacks are. I'm just going to let you quickly read it for a second. So meta exploit one quite handy along with your credential harvesting. Uh, your credential harvesting is the thing that most people are going to be using. Again, trying to steal those creds. Web jacking is what I'm going to be showing you, which is going to be your website cloning of sort of like a URL. So I'm going to be uh, showing you quickly how it's done. So after selecting that web jacking module, you are going to be going in. It gives you three options. It's like use the template use a custom code so that's where you would just put in your own HTT, uh, HTML, CSS, all of that kind of stuff and make your own sort of website by manually hard coding it. This is really good if you want to clone uh, websites that are sort of like slightly larger or very complicated web design. Um, whereas most of the time the sort of like just give me a URL and I'll clone it kind of thing it works perfectly fine. So I'm going to be cloning the machine on my local network that is running Pi-hole. Uh, I'm only doing this on local network again because I don't want to clone someone else's website. I don't want to end up accidentally doing something or getting something wrong. So I'm doing this as my own internal sort of like real uh, cloning attack. So it's redirecting everything to standard HTTP from a HTTPS tag. So my HTTPS is sort of like where I'm going to and from. So my pie hole is called Goofy. Uh, it takes ages depending on the size of the website because this is just a simple little web UI for a Docker container. It doesn't take overly long. When you log into the website, it gives you a printout from the IP that has hit your website, um, getting the page icons, getting the fab icons, and it redirects you to sort of like a site saying, the site has moved. You can change this message to whatever you want. You can upload technically the website there, uh, but most of the time it will redirect you to a fake website. So I ended up getting a fake pie hole web UI with a valid password box because it is labeled as a password box. Um, it didn't autofill my password, which is good because I didn't, you don't want it to autofill your password because it's technically a separate website, but it can autofill if they get it to redirect properly with DNS and everything like that. If you're using just without a password manager, it can be very, very easy to fall into these traps. So this is me attacking a or cloning the Facebook login site. Again, do not do this for anything other than educational purposes or to demonstrate something. This is only for demonstration purposes. I am not actually going to be uploading this site because that is incredibly bad, but I am just doing it for my own personal uh, and your personal and educational development. So here we have just a Facebook logon code. So here we have a um, sort of like a caveat window. If you are doing this uh, with a real attack, you can go through and remove all these errors, get rid of a load of this stuff um, and sort of like make it a lot more professional so that people don't know. But as for the login box, very, very good login box, looks real. I don't know how many of you have actually seen the Facebook login page in a very long time because a lot of stuff is stored with cookies and everything like that. So it's going to be very unlikely that you actually need to. Uh, but this is the login site. When you enter your password, email address, all of that kind of stuff, it will get sent and pinged to your um, proper sort of like console. Here you can sort of like add additional information you can write small scripts that then point them to the real one saying you put an invalid password in and then you redirect them to the real facebook or the real twitter instagram whatever you want and it will then launch the attack from there and they just re-enter their password and they say oh i must have typed something wrong but then you have a full live grab of their password but this password is not 100 percent accurate because every time that you put in a space it will add a plus sign there are some other ones of these caveats that it doesn't quite like um so 
it is slightly weird. If you put a plus sign as well, it does weird things. But as long as their password is pretty simple, it's completely fine. So I'm going to generate a report and see what the report looks like once I've entered a couple more fake email addresses. So this is the kind of output that you are going to expect after you've been letting it run for a little bit. You get a couple of hits. It does print a report out afterwards if you use the connect fan switch, um, but it is in a horrible, horrible format. Uh, it's probably best just to go through and dump them all into a sort of like your own personal text files where you are taking their email as their login information and dumping that into the like a custom username um, field, or uh, username uh, password box, uh, login credentials in Hydra, um, and then taking your passwords and dumping those into a genuine password folder or a password file for, again, something like Hydra to use. Um, as I'm illustrating the point uh, right here, the, the software can't differentiate a space from a plus mark. So when you are going through and you get plus, just be careful that it could be a space that they are using for their password. It could be a plus sign. There is no way of telling, but you can get something like um, CWL, which is a wordless generator in um, Kali to be able to sort of like interpret this for you, replace them with spaces, exclamation points, whatever you want. Um, I haven't tested a lot of symbols in this, but I know that at least spaces don't work as they should. So one of these, is, as I say, is a genuine plus mark, and one of them is a space. So just be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over and show you some of the other cool things very, very quickly that this thing can do um, and this software can do. And then we are going to be heading over to Discord to get our real sort of like um, and go into some more of the cybersecurity news of the week and stuff like that. As we were talking a bit about uh, last week in Discord afterwards, we were on about how hard it is to do CTFs on Windows boxes or hack into Windows boxes because they are in, like they're way more complicated. There's so many more moving parts. Whereas at least with Linux, you every Linux distribution is the same. There's a lot of ways in and out. So uh, this is a PowerShell attack because it's got the as I was saying earlier a bunch of pen testing stuff and it's automated pen testing. So the PowerShell attack is quite nice. If you get a password to a Linux uh, to a Windows box, um, you can just use that to get a full uh, sort of like uh, reverse shell um, without letting antiviruses on, because it's done all in RAM. So it is incredibly useful for that kind of a thing. So uh, the DRAC system, like the option for Dell DRAC, um, is a interface management for Dell servers. So a lot of servers have what's called a management port on them. So it means that you can turn them on and off remotely. You can change disks. You can change clock speeds, enter the BIOS, all that stuff whilst the server's running. Um, and the DRAC is the Dell equivalent of that. HP has the ILO system, um, and I have one of each of these kinds of servers. Um, so both of these uh, servers can be checked with the default credit checker um, it takes a couple of seconds to do uh, the entire slash 24 network that I was on and it checks them for like the most common four or five vulnerabilities that these DRACs are susceptible to. Um, I did it before I updated my firmware um, and it said that there was a potential way in so I updated my firmware and now it's saying that there's no ways in on that box which is very nice for me. Um, there's some user in, uh, iteration attacks um, and you can run in code your own SQL stuff. Um, but there's a lot of stuff in this sort of like package. So here we have some of the uh, payloads that it can create. So it is inside the uh, framework, uh, the social engineer toolkit framework, it will load in Metasploit. Um, <clears throat> and you can do a bunch of these pre-written payloads. So these are, you will attach to an email. Um, so when they double click the attachment, it will do some kind of attack. So uh, first one, you all know what RAR and zip files are, I hope. They are compressed file format. So you can say, here is a collection of X, um, a collection of billings from 2016 all the way to now. So they'll have to open up the RAR file to be able to access them, something like that. Um, Flash. Flash is now being faded out, uh, RIP mini clip and stuff like that. but here we have some of the attacks that can be used with that. 
um, some just straight buffer overflows, which are very, very uh, nice once you know how they're done. Um, but they are quite hard to uh, sort of like create in the first place because they're very, very finicky. Um, but there's a lot of different attacks that then you would just embed them uh, in an email or something like that and forward them out that way. So all of these kinds of things can be done with the SET framework. And the reason that we didn't cover it earlier is again, you need this kind of background knowledge. Now you sort of like have heard of all of these different programs, these features, what these kinds of attacks are. They uh, all run in the background, which is very, very nice um, to be able to then work out what, what isn't happening. So in short, we have covered different kinds of social engineering. Um, so phishing, vishing, SMS, in uh, snail mail. We have covered the social engineer toolkit package, uh, some of the additions that can be brought in with that, uh, some of the extra applications that you can run with that and the other things that you can do with it. So whether that be uh, email attacks, whether that be cloning websites, whether that be grabbing user credentials, all that kind of stuff. Carl has produced a video this week as well, which is the kind of tools and stuff he uses um, on his Linux distributions and uh, sort of like that kind of thing so that you can go away and start getting into some good practices, start learning a little bit more about the background information and where we get all of our information from. Um, I'm going to be doing probably a slightly more in-depth talk on this um, for Christmas so that you can go away and over Christmas listen, watch a bunch of stuff. Um, just to stay up to date with the new cybersecurity news and stuff. But we are going to be going over to the Discord, so thank you very much. So as I say, we are going over to the Discord now, so feel free to contact us, come over, chat with us. We're going to be going over cybersecurity news if you want to know any more about the SE tool toolkit, how you can get into maybe some of this kind of stuff. Uh, come over, we'll be over there chatting about that. So Discord. So as I say, we are going to be covering more of the social engineer toolkit and everything like that. So if you have any questions, uh, I've got double audio. That's horrible. Uh, never mind. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be covering a bit more about the social engineer toolkit, talking about how much it costs a company, uh, how ramped up this actually is out in the real world, um, and hopefully just getting some of your opinions and some of your thoughts on how, what phishing emails you've seen and all of that kind of stuff. So we're going to be dipping over there now. So if you do want to join us, feel free. If not, thank you very much for coming today. Um, and we hope to see you at the same time next week. It will be our last one till after the new year. Um, so just keep that in mind. There's next week we have one, and then we won't have one till after the new year. So thank you very much.